Hello everyone, Adrian Fabris here. Um, this is a recording of a presentation that I did for a CET short course that was on recently on basin hosted base metal mineral systems. So the title of the talk is sediment hosted deposits of the Southern Australian Craton and exploration implications. So it's by myself and my co-author Carmen um, Cruft. Okay. So I'll start with a map showing major deposits in South Australia. So while we have world-class zirconium and significant uranium um, deposits within basins, it's fair to say that South Australia isn't really known for large um, basin hosted base metal deposits. But notably, and it's a bit of trivia really, um, we do have the Capunda deposit located just north of Adelaide, which was actually the first metal mine in Australia and Burra which was actually the largest deposit in Australia for 10 years from uh, 1845. So and together these two mines form the, the cornerstone of the South Australian economy um, after colonisation. Um, and, and both of those are, are basin hosted. But there are many um, examples of, of smaller um, basin hosted occurrences in South Australia. Yeah, coming up there. Um, and plenty of potential which I'll talk about. The photo on the right is from the picturesque northern Flinders and it shows um, deformed neoproterozoic sediments with the arrow there pointing down where um, you have Cambrian sediments um, onlapping. Um, and these Cambrian sediments are host to um, a number of um, a small MVT style um, prospects and occurrences. So the aim of this talk is to provide some, some regional geology um, and history of basin deposition over South Australia, um, expand on, on the most important period of time with regards to um, base metal deposits in the South Australian Craton and highlight the main exploration models with um, a few examples. And what I really wanna do is highlight controls on mineralization as I go through. So we'll start with a basic map of South Australia, uh, marking the uh, Archean to early Mesoproterozoic Gawla Kratom, and what is regarded as basement provinces of the um, Musgraves and, and Kernamona. Now, all three of these um, include meta sediments, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to consider the basement um, to cover the basin cover, and this is for a number of reasons, um, not least of which is that there aren't really any major examples of genuine sediment hosted mineralization without um, and possibly dominant, dominated by um, overprint from metamorphism and subsequent magmatism. And so it's hard to gain much insight on, um, on true sediment hosted mineral systems. So it, it's worth um, pointing out, however, that um, Paleoproterozoic sediments um, do occur in the, in the Gawler and were deposited around the eastern margin of the, um, the crater, more than the eastern margin, um, and have a, a significant role in base metal mineralization. So for example, Hutchison Group um, metaseds um, are well known as hosting sub-economic um, occurrences of, of lead and zinc, and these have had additional metals added, being upgraded by later magmatism. So an example being Manini Dam. Uh, slightly younger sediments are thought to provide metals and brines uh, for significant um, IOCG deposits that formed in this region, driven by later magnetism. Then in the Kernamona, um, many of these, many of the base metal occurrences um, give a epigenetic age relating to later magnetism. Um, but in many cases, copper mineralization is controlled by redox boundaries and carbonate rich lithologies um, within basinal sediments, such as at like, Kaukaru. So, various parts of the Williama supergroup are also understood to be prospective for Mount Isa style zinc lead and Broken Hill um, lead zinc silver, but unfortunately, there aren't any major examples um, in SA yet. Okay, um, to the basins. 
So rifting in the in the mid to late Mesoproterozoic over the Gawler form the Karalu Basin. So this is filled with a, a thick succession of fluvial red beds deposited within a uh, intracratonic basin. So while a, a significant um, sediment source included mineralized rocks of the Gawler, um, locally including like the tops of several ICG deposits, we believe, at the time. Um, a lack of sin sedimentary volcanism and reactive sedimentary packages means that, um, that really this sediment package is regarded as being a, a source rock for subsequent mineral systems rather than hosting deposits, uh, base metal deposits in its own right. So extension um, and rifting associated with the breakup of Rodinia um, saw in the Neoproterozoic resulted in significant sedimentation uh, within what's referred to as the Adelaide Rift Complex and its associated um, components. So Neoproterozoic sedimentation also occurs in the Officer Basin that extends across to the Western Australian Craton and the um, um, Warburton Basin um, to the north between the South Australian Craton and the North Australian Craton. So sedimentation was thickest in the Adelaide Rift Complex and subsequent deformation um, exposed them forming the world famous um, Flinders Ranges and, and Adelaide Hills that flank the, the city of Adelaide. So there are several deposit styles of interest which I'll expand on. Um, but include sedimentary copper and um, there's a number of diapy related copper occurrences and um, strata bound um, lead zinc is, is also another important um, example. So the Cambrian saw a renewed rifting and volcanism and widespread um, deposition, including off to the, the southeast as newly, um, as newly formed crust. And this also um, is a significant period of mineralization with key styles including um, um, ZX, MVTs and, and strata bound and copper gold. And from then on things get a little bit less interesting um, from a base metal perspective. So late Carboniferous to Triassic um, saw so, you know, this a major period for a number of our um, patrol resources. Then um, uh, later in the Mesozoic um, is uh, we've got known um, coal deposits and, and various um, um, placer gold um, deposits, a lot of reduced um, units with pyritic, pyritic shales with anomalous valleys for a range of metals but no significant occurrences other than uranium that I'm aware of. And then finally distribution of the uh, Cenozoic sediments and these host world-class heavy mineral sands deposits um, and sedimentary uranium um, but not, not really base metals. So this leads to a series of, of um, stacked basins which make it, makes life pretty difficult for explorers um, as shown in that image on the, in the right there but if we consider mostly uh, low metamorphic grade basin sedimentation. Um, you'd have to say the most significant time period within the South Australian Craton was the Neoproterozoic to Middle Cambrian. So this figure from um, Lloyd et al. Um, 2020 puts this into context. So they propose the term Adelaide Super Basin um, to represent the Neoproterozoic to Middle Cambrian of the um, South Australian Craton and support it as part of the Centralian Super Basin, which again represents um, rift basins developed during the breakup of, um, of Virginia. So let's uh, dig into that a little bit further. So the LA Super Basin is made up of a number of components. So there's the, the central Adelaide Rift Complex and then shelf sedimentation over the Gawler, known as the Stuart Shelf, and platform sedimentation over the Kurnamona province. And as I go through the sedimentary history in, in a bit more detail, um, you'll note 
the significant occurrence of, of reactive units and important components for hosting base metal uh, mineral systems. Um, the basement that this succession was deposited on is, is not all that well constrained, but it's understood to be just the extension of the um, eastern Gawler. Um, um, and then, you know, on the Gawler proper, we know um, there's the eastern Gawler, there's lots of ICG deposits and um, there's a reasonable chance of metal endowment um, in the basement to the Neoprotozoic, the LA Rift Complex. So initial sedimentation was associated with rifting and contains um, immature clastics, uh, bimodal uh, volcanics, but dominantly definitely mafic volcanism associated with um, rifting, um, carbonates and, and evaporitic facies. And then these load the basin, so these, you know, these load the basin with source rocks. Um, after a time, a bit of a time break, um, we see uh, a bunch of sandstones, siltstones and, and dolomites. Um, then a, a, a package um, that includes the Sturdian and, and Maranoan um, glacials and sedimentation between that period. So dominantly um, glaciogenic um, succession, siltstones, sandstones and carbonates. Um, this is um, a very important um, stage in in the basin sedimentation and includes going from the rift phase to uh, a sag phase of deposition and host to the Tapley Hill formation, which is um, a unit that is widely distributed across um, that rift complex and onto the shelves and, and platform. So post um, glaciogenic sedimentation, uh, some siltstones and sandstones and a little bit of carbonates um, within the Alpina group and this is host to the um, world famous Ediacra fauna. So after a bit of a disconformity move into the um, Cambrian and we see marine shelf carbonates, um, some red beds in that lower ca Cambrian um, and then renewed rifting particularly um, renewed rifting in the Kamantu trough, which saw uh, again like um, impetual clastics, um, turbidites, pyritic shale, siltstones, and some more, uh, and some exhalative horizons. Um, this is followed by a phase of deformation and um, magmatism, and there's a, a Delamirian orogeny. So, looking at this in terms of um, major mineralization styles. You know, if you think about that geodynamic setting that this is in um, and that sedimentary history, yeah, um, there's a range, uh, range of um, deposit styles which um, you, know, you typically see in, in this kind of setting. So in particular, um, sedimentary copper, um, ZX styles, MVTs, and and structurally controlled um, copper gold. And so the focus of this talk is going to be on these models um, through the Neoprotozoic to Cambrian age um, sedimentary basins, of which there are, are many examples and, and have been the focus of considerable exploration interest over the years. So um, starting from the top, highlighting those deposit styles. So the Ancus deposit is located not far from, from Adelaide um, within the Kamantu trough. So um, on the edge of a trough developed through, through rifting, um, Angus is, is one of many similar but typically smaller, smaller um, SEDEX style deposits within that Kamantu trough. Um, so located here, I think you can see my cursor. Um, the Angus mine is currently on care and maintenance, but has recently been mined. Um, it's had a relatively modest, had a relatively modest resource, um, but some, some pretty good grades. So historically, um, also supergene ores of similar deposit styles have been worked um, in in the nearby region, such as um, uh, Strathalbyn. 
So the host sequence um, to Angus is the um, Tapanapa formation, which is um, part of a turbidite sequence. It's a rapid deposition of, of fertile sediments. Um, the mineralization sequence is, is strata bound and sulfide rich, as shown in the um, image in the center um, bottom there. So interestingly, ore shoots um, are surrounded by manganiferous garnet, which is used to support its um, exhalative um, origin. So image on the, on the bottom left there shows um, uh, some an example of an uh, exhalative horizon that's been um, found elsewhere in the region, not too far away. So the issue with um, true interpretations of exact mineralization mechanism in the region is that subsequent to deposition, there was a phase of compression. And right at the end of this orogeny, um, possibly associated with um, delamination, um, an extensive belt of um, intrusions punched up through the crust, um, forming high temperature and, and low pressure um, metamorphism. Now this is um, fantastic from a uh, mineralization point of view, as you had like, fertile immature sediments and then a significant heat driver and fluid sources, like so metamorphic and possibly magmatic fluids um, having an influence, so a um, great set of in, uh, ingredients. But importantly, for, for many of the occurrences in this region, they tend to be, um, so although they, they tend to be strata bound, um, suggesting that lithological control, um, because of this later metamorphism and um, magmatism, it does blur um, some of the clear evidence um, for some of the prospects in this region, their deposit style. So off to the um, Cayman II um, copper gold um, deposit. So um, also in um, Tapanapa formation, but um, unlike many of the other occurrences in the region, Cayman II is, is a copper gold deposit with very little lead, zinc and silver in it. And it provides an example of a, another style of mineralization in the region um, has been mined at various times since the, the 19th um, century and is, is currently an active mine. Um, it's got a resource of about 24 um, million tonnes there. Okay, so its genesis has been oh, somewhat hotly contested over the years. Because of the presence, really, because you know, because of the fact that there's other SEDEX deposits in the region, um, but more recent work has shown that there's really strong structural control as well as um, lithological control, and that mineralization either developed um, from metamorphic fluids um, or magmatic fluids just post mineralization uh, metamorphism. So the image on the right. Um, is from um, bottom of hole, blast hole, um, copper um, values, and it shows um, ore shoots at a range of um, orientations, which at least some relate to specific structures. So while there's there is a lithological control at, at Cayman II, um, the deposit provides an example that underlines the importance of subsequent orogenesis and magnetism um, to be that energy driver um, for circulating fluids, potentially adding metal, metals and, and ultimately um, forming deposits in basin sediments. So you may have seen in the earlier map that there are many deposits um, in the Cayman to trough, but these stop on the map or they stop where you get younger cover of the Murray Basin, so the Cenozoic Murray Basin. Um, this is the main reason really that there aren't any occurrences off to the east, um, really just because there hasn't been much exploration under cover. There's a few prospects. Um, and when we look at the bigger picture shown on this slide, um, Cambrian sediments continue to the east and are associated with arc volcanism, 
with South Australia being in a back arc setting during the times, um, during a number of these times. Um, but the timing and, and position of, of active um, arcs in South Australia are not well constrained, um, but just add to the potential of this area. So when you look at the mineral systems ingredients in the region um, for forming base metal deposits, um, the right components are there. So black shales, pyritic units, and carbonates. Um, a plumbing system developed during deformation, and then magnetism, magnetism as a driver. <coughs> and I'll just quickly add that um, quickly add that uh, this is one of the reasons why the GSSA are investigating this region in a, a large research. Um, focused drilling program happening later this year, so that's the MINEX CRC um, NDI. Okay, so stepping down into the um, platform um, carbonates where we see um, MVT style um, mineralization. <laughs> Okay, so the Ediacara mineral field is located in the northern Flinders and includes several occurrences. It has worked in the past but has um, um, had, had, had relatively low grades. Um, mineralisation occurs within the um, Dolomitic Ajax limestone um, and specifically within Dolomitic breaches that form along the margins um, of a, a syncline of Cambrian carbonate over the uh, Neoproterozoic, um, as shown in that, that central image geology map um, uh, in the centre of the slide there. So, um, so the geology map there shows the northern part of the Adelaide Rift complex, um, and in the little dots, if you can see them, um, point out a number of lead occurrences that occur in that region and, and a lot of them um, are associated with that um, um, Cambrian um, on lap on the Neoproterozoic. Also hosted in lower Cambrian carbonates is the rather oh, a bit unusual um, Beltana zinc deposit where mineralisation instead of being in sulphides is actually in um, dominantly silicate um, zinc silicates. So this is a, a high grade deposit that has been worked uh, a number of times um, and it's also located in the, in the northern Flinders. So the deposit genesis is thought to be by low to moderate temperature hydrothermal fluid input causing karstic collapse and breaches um, and these are controlled by, by structures. Um, age dating puts it as um, forming after deformation um, and supports a link to heating known in the adjacent Mount Painter region, so at, at around 440 million years. Um, lead isotope analysis suggests um, local basement um, as the source of metals. So, and, and apparently, um, the presence of so this more recent studies, the presence of arsenates in fluids um, inhibits the precipitation of sulphides and thought to be the reason why you get zinc um, rich silicates at this, um, this deposit. Okay, so into the Neoproterozoic now and onto um, sediment hosted um, copper um, style, which shows considerable potential in the allayed. Um, super basin and there's there's many examples of this deposit style and I'll show you a, a few of those in a bit more detail. So I'll say here that I've also um, included um, oxide copper as a deposit style which really refers to supergene enrichment um, that can come from exposing copper rich parts of the sequence and is very common in exposed areas of the um, Adelaide Rift Complex. So modern mineral systems analysis really looks at all scales. So a recent work by Geoscience Australia looking at the um, LAB or um, 
this etheric um, thickness model um, shows a strong association between continental margins and, and base metal mineralization, highlighting um, the Mount Isa region and putting the margin of the um, Adelaide Rift complex in a, in a pretty good place. Um, if we take a look at all the copper occurrences in SA, it paints a pretty clear picture. In fact, 40% of the uh, copper occurrences in South Australia are actually hosted in near Proterozoic sediments of the um, LA Rift complex. Now, many of these um, relate to, to small occurrences, and I need to point out that it does reflect the fact that this region is um, exposed. So um, here's a generalised geology map for the region. Um, but it does indicate the mobilisation of a lot of copper. So why is this region so copper rich? Um, circulating oxidised saline fluids, um, I suppose at one scale, but on a broad scale, um, a very important ingredient is um, its location above and proximal to enriched subcontinental lithic mantle. Um, and, you know, this enrichment in the SCLM um, is seen as uh, a function of, um, you know, multiple uh, subduction events um, and Interestingly, a, a similar um, uh, notion or idea has been put forward to the Contangan Basin in the African Copper Belt and seen as being an important ingredient for um, copper um, fertility in, in that region as well. So having a closer look at the uh, gelatinal components of um, the basin again, so it's basically made up of a, a central depot centre that's been subsequently folded um, and shelf and platform sediments on, on either side. Notably, the, the Stuart Shelf overlies the Olympic Copper Gold province, which we know is, is highly enriched with respect to copper. So if we have a look at a generalised section that's been done in the past, marked by that red line, bring that up, and compare this to the um, generalised model for sedimentary copper, we'll see there are a number of similarities. So starting at the base, um, we see um, the bimodal volcanics, um, some red beds associated with um, evaporitic units that and, and we know that have led to um, significant diaporism um, known within the Adelaide Rift Complex. Um, then moving up, that, that thick um, sand dominated package and, and carbonates and siltstones of the burrow group. Um, sitting over the top of that is the um, uh, Tapley Hill Formation, which is a um, you know somewhat carbonaceous and um, calcareous um, um, shale. That, that covers the entire um, basin and uh, some um, carbonate units sit over the top of that and potentially that's something that um, is a bit of a question in, in the Adelaide Rift Complex is these cap carbonates and, and how effective they were to help support these circulation cells but there are um, cap carbonates um, around. So in the traditional um, sedimentary copper model, um, the best location for copper mineralisation is along growth faults um, and in compartmentalised sub-basins, which are you know, really hard to, to recognise now in, in the central um, rift complex due to complex folding um, and, and you know, during the Delamirian orogeny. Nevertheless, um, uh, the model predicts that um, it's the, that first major reductant that will see metal precipitation. And this is exactly what we do see um, with the Tapley Hill formation, um, which marks that 
maximum flooding surface after the Sturdian glaciation. So in addition to this, we, we commonly see um, uh, copper mineralization around dye piers in carbonates and along structures, so just like the model would suggest. However, the um, Tapley Hill formation is commonly is, is very commonly mineralized and um, is commonly the host to to many of the um, um, said copper occurrences um, in the region. And we'll delve into that a bit more. So oh, yeah, one such example is Kapunda, shown there. Um, so Kapunda sits within the Adelaide Rift Complex and is located just north of Adelaide. It's um, located on a, a major structure, which may well represent an early growth fault. Um, and as I mentioned, um, Kapunda uh, really did kickstart the South Australian economy. Um, this early phase of uh, the early phase of mining extracted extremely rich um, veins developed by supergene processes. Um, there is a, a resource for the for the primary uh, mineralization, but it's it's much lower grade. So out of vitreous Kapunda is, is currently being investigated as a uh, an in situ recovery operation, um, taking advantage of the thick weathering profile and, and supergene upgrading. And this uh, method of, of mining has potential to um, be quite effective at a number of other um, uh, supergene um, enriched, uh, you know, originally said copper um, mineralization elsewhere in, in the Adelaide Rift Complex. So the Adelaide Rift Complex appears to have all the right ingredients. So it's the right um, geological setting, um, uh, a pretty favourable time in the Earth history in terms of getting um, copper mineralisation. It's got a prolonged um, depositional history, um, contains evaporites, host rocks, source rocks, a lot of structural traps. Um, the basement is particularly endowed and many demonstrated um, copper occurrences. Um, but I suppose the question really is, you know, where are the big deposits? Um, in the African, Central African Copper Belt uh, model, uh, the biggest deposits are actually located on the margins of the depot centre. This points um, to a domain known as the um, Torrens Hinge Zone. Unfortunately for much of um, the Torrens Hinge Zone, it's, it's beyond explorable depths. However, this is not true for all of it. Um, and these are the zones, um, the zones where it is in ex explorable depths are currently being investigated um, actively by exploration companies. But at this time, the most significant said copper occurrences have been found on the uh, Stewart Shelf um, out to the west. Um, on the uh, Stewart Shelf, the stratigraphy is, is a little bit different. So the Tapley Hill formation that um, it, it is pretty widespread, um, it, but it doesn't have the underlying um, clastics and evaporitic sequences from the central part of the basin that's part of the model. And it is, is uncertain whether there's actually any hydrological connection um, out from the central part of the basin out into the shelf like shown in the arrow there. Um, but potentially the key ingredients to form um, sedimentary copper mineralization are still there. So underlying the Neoproterozoic is the Mesoproterozoic Karaloo Basin and it's filled with red bed sandstones. And this sequence appears to form an important role in the formation of deposits um, on the Stewart Shelf perhaps as a source, but certainly as a pathway for oxidizing fluids. So this is what the um, units typically look like. So Pandara formation, um, usually oxidized, but um, with um, reduced zones and reduced spots in it. Um, 
coarse grained commonly, um, Tapley Hill formation, um, so a, a fine grained um, shaley kind of unit with carbonates and, and um, sulfidic units within it. Um, overlying the Tapley Hill formation is the Weiler sandstone, um, which again is uh, definitely has some immature sediment um, component to it, where you still see lots of um, um, the feldspar in it, um, commonly medium to, to coarse grained, and that's capped by a, um, a very common, um, although thin, um, common carbonate unit of the Nicolina formation. So the Tapley Hill formation varies um, from a, a, a few metres to a few hundred metres thick. It's technically a, a siltstone to, to fine sandstone with carbonaceous and calcareous and pyritic intervals. Um, most of it was deposited um, below wave base, um, but rip-up class and edgewise um, conglomerates shown in the centre there um, indicate facies above wave base. So sulphide is, is, is mostly very fine grained, um, very difficult to even see um, along bedding planes, but it is occasionally um, very coarse, as shown in that image just to the right of the centre. Um, and I'll, I'll point out that sulphitic zones uh, commonly have um, elevated uh, metal values throughout um, um, the, the the basin, but it's only where other factors seem to be in play that you see increased grades. So where it is min mineralized, it actually doesn't look all that different to the images that you see um, on the on the on the slide there. But in detail, the original sulphide has been overprinted by copper sulphides. Um, and on the right there is a, is a fantastic um, thin section image produced by. Adelaide Uni from samples from Mount Gunson and shows um, a pyrite being overprinted by increasingly increasing tenor um, copper sulphides. So examples from the Stuart Shelf, well there are, are three main deposits and mineralised districts and these are um, Mount Gunson, Emmy Bluff and, and Mole Creek. And these examples demonstrate a few additional controls on mineralisation on top of having that reduced shape. Um, and I'll, and I'll, I'll go through some of these. So I'll start with Mount Gunson, where the major control seems to be a, a fault block of um, Pandara formation. So first looking at a um, schematic model for this region. So through this district, mineralisation occurs in a range of hosts um, around this coarse block of Pandara formation. These um, include the Pandara formation itself in, in um, glacial breaches and the Tapley Hill formation um, and the overlying sandstone unit. So with the um, stratigraphy like pinching out um, against um, and over this, this horse block um, um, being the, the commonality with all these occurrences. So this is um, known as the Panadi um, culmination upwork. Um, it's likely that, that faults um, involved a, a, a long lived and could have um, had a connection or, um, to underlying basement rocks. Um, Further to this, sulphur isotope analysis of ores has supported um, a contribution from magmatically sourced sulphur, and therefore at least some metal contribution from, um, from basement sources. So the, the geology map on, on the right shows the various deposits in and around the um, fault block, and there's a number of others in addition to the ones shown there, that all occur around um, this fault block of Pandara formation shown in, in the yellow on that map. So mining has occurred at, at several of these. The um, 
so Mount Gunson is, is typically used to refer to um, the term Mount Gunson used to refer to several deposits shown in that map. Um, mining has occurred over several intervals as far back as, as um, 1899, <clears throat> um, and over 156,000 tonnes of copper copper has been extracted and a significant amount of, of cobalt. So most recently. Um, it was uh, metal has been extracted in more of a heat bleach style um, method. So at the, um, the the cattle grid pit or deposit um, chalcosite forms the, the matrix of um, Maranoan um, permafrost breaches, but copper sulfides are also found in the overlying sandstone, so um, whale sandstone. Um, so Mile Creek is located in the south where um, beta basalt, um, that, that basal early um, wrist phase basalt, appears to be the key ingredient. So at Mile Creek, um, copper occurs in the Tapler Hill Formation over a very large area actually, shown on the map on, on the left, the hashed area. Um, with, with grades up to about 2%. So the thing that is particularly interesting about Mile Creek is that mineralization only really occurs in the Tapley Hill Formation where it overlies Pandara Formation red beds, or also classic sediments associated with the extrusion um, of the um, beta basalt, um, so a backy point formation. Um, and, and not when it, so you don't see mineralization in the Tapley Hill Formation um, so much when it's directly over the basalt. So this really supports the role of fluid flow through underlying permeable units. Um, but in this um, deposit example, um, the, the basalt probably is the likely source of copper. Um, and I'll, I'll just quote um, the most recent a quote from most recent exploration effort in the area. Uh, this suggests that mineralization is not simply a function of depositional environment within the Tapley Hill formation and really supports the movement of very oxidized fluids within porous sediments of the Pandara formation. Um, it really was a significant um, contributor. So the third significant occurrence is Emmy Bluff. Um, the Emmy Bluff deposit sits directly above a significant ICG occurrence in the basement. And it has long been speculated that there is some kind of connection. So at Emmy Bluff, the Tapley Hill formation occurs at around 400 metres depth. Um, it's proximal, but not against a horse block like at Mount Gunson. Um, having said this, slump breaches are interpreted to indicate active faulting during deposition and therefore some tectonism in the area. Uh, mineralization occurs at the top and base of the Tapley Hill Formation. Um, so mineralization at the top also transgress transgresses into the overlying sandstone. So this area is currently being explored and the company recently published uh, an upper and lower resource with a, with a reasonable total tonnage. So again up there, um, uh, the 40 to, to 70 million tonnes total um, at um, OK grades there, but significantly um, there's a fair amount of um, there's, there's um, cobalt anom anomalism associated with um, the mineralization here. So the image, really nice image on the right of a sulfide grain um, from Tapley Hill Formation from around um, ME Bluff, it was produced by um, Codes and shows the original framboidal kind of texture of, of pyrite in the center surrounded by partially replaced um, copper sulfide and then another generation of pyrite. 
really highlights a complex history of sulphide precipitation in the area. So if we look at the basin as a whole, many questions still remain. So that the timing of, of mineralisation is, is still uncertain. Understanding all the, com the key controls and which areas are, are most likely to host the big deposits. So this is just um, how the, the survey are tackling um, these questions um, on the Stuart Shelf region within a, um, a current and ongoing um, project on sedimentary copper. So we're looking at this project in collaboration with um, CSIRO. So we're re-logging um, key holes with a focus on characterising um, facies, lithology, sedimentary structures, um, you know, depositional environment and, and redox. Looking to do um, stratigraphic um, correlations across the Stuart Shelf to understand basin structure and, and, and basin evolution um, and overall basin architecture um, is going to be a component of, of that, looking at the, the geophysics and various other methods. Um, taking a, uh, a sequence stratigraphic approach to that logging to um, try to get those reconstructions. Um, and then on each of these key holes, collecting um, downhole data. So for example, portable XRF data, gamma, um, and um, whole rock geochemistry, some isotopes, um, isotopic data will also be collected. This is something, something to look forward to, um, and you'll hear more about that um, in the near future. So this is an example of some of the logging of lithology and stratigraphy. So trying to identify that maximum flooding surface, and gamma is a, a good way of doing that. Um, collecting multi-element um, geochemistry using portable XRF, and um, on the right there. Um, looking at mineralogy with um, um, spectral techniques, a high logger technique, um, looking for uh, um, any alteration patterns. Okay, some conclusions then. So South Australia has demonstrated occurrences of sedimentary um, copper, so both of a, what would be considered a Zambian style and also um, the Kupferschiefer style. Um, SEDEX stole deposits, structurally controlled copper gold mineralisation, um, VHMS deposits also, which I haven't really talked um, much about, but um, in that Cayman 2 trough region, and that's something you'll hear more about through our NDI, Delamirian NDI program, um, and then also MBT stole deposits, particularly in, in um, Cambrian um, in synclines. And, and, came in overlying the, the near pro. So while there are a complex series of stacked basins in, in SA, um, probably the main interval hosting a lot of the base metal mineral occurrences is that Neoproterozoic to Cambrian um, phase, so the LA super basin. Um, and the important thing is that you know, a lot of the key ingredients are there for forming major deposits. So some of the important ingredients that come up time and time again really are those reactive um, host rocks, particularly carbonates and reduced shales, pyritic shales. Um, structures um, obviously play a, a very important role with architecture um, for focusing fluids. And um, for at least some deposits, the key driver seems to be subsequent deformation and, and heating um, that has occurred. And perhaps in South Australia, the underlying metalliferous um, basement to the basins may play a pretty important role. Um, and with these um, ingredients combined, there's, uh, you know, we have our fingers crossed that uh, a major um, deposit will be discovered in, in, in South Australia, if, um, and one of these deposit styles uh, is, is probably the most likely. So just quickly, references. 
um, and like to just acknowledge um, some contribution from um, Mitch Bockman, Anthony Reid and Georgina Gordon and also acknowledge um, the efforts of many explorers um, past and present um, on uh, a lot of the information that I, um, I've used in this talk. All right, thank you for listening.